Listening to your call, you said the economy is more than likely in the beginning stage of a downturn. Now that we see and hear what Jay Powell has to say, the Fed is going to stay hawkish. Do you think a recession is inevitable? You know, I'm uh, no macroeconomist, so I'm glad, uh, you know, Mr. Powell is, uh, is, is in charge, not me. Um, I do think that uh, the need for buy now, pay later goes up, both in a case of recession, because folks are trying to make sure that their cash flow is impacted as little as possible, and in the inflation, which is where we are right now, the pocketbook is hit harder because everything is a little bit more expensive. So we are seeing more demand for the product, but because of the uncertainty in the macroeconomic events ahead, it seems very prudent to be very, very focused on credit outcomes, and that, that's reflected in our guide. Can you give us some color on what you're seeing in consumer spending habits? You know, obviously, uh, consumers are under pressure. Everything is more expensive, from gas to groceries. How is that uh, reflected in your data? So there's definitely the great rotation. We've talked about this before, but uh, the, you know, sometime mid-May, a tremendous number of goods were replaced with services. And I think it corresponds more than anything to this idea that we've all been cooped up for a long time because of the pandemic. But over the 4th of July weekend, we saw unbelievable growth in travel, um, you know, experiences, tickets, all the sort of standard things that you'd expect people sort of jump back onto after COVID. They're, they're all still doing really, really well. And that demand is very, very strong. There's definitely real weakness relative to last year and even the year before in things like homewares um, and uh, you know, quite a lot of other things that just were we pre-purchased during the pandemic, if you will. Now, our point of view is actually a little bit skewed because we're still growing really, really quickly. We saw you know, over 300% growth in general merchandise, which is just the growth we're seeing within our partners like Walmart and Target and Amazon. You know, folks are buying commodities because that you know that's something that you buy all the time anyway. And so we're seeing extraordinary growth within the merchants that we have. But I think very broadly, e-commerce grew only 7% last year, which is probably the lowest number in a very long time. For comparison, a firm grew 11-fold that much, but uh, perhaps in a better year would have grown even faster. So we're seeing uh, credit, uh, Americans' credit, at you know highs not seen since the financial crisis. I'm wondering, if the economy is in a more difficult position and consumers are under pressure, does that mean more business for buy now, pay later, and affirm? But is that not good for the economy? You know, it's a careful balance. Um, it is definitely good for us, so long as we're good at our job, which is managing risk and underwriting. And we are, we, we are very confident in our ability and our latest numbers prove that pretty decisively. So, you know, I think that that's, we, we continue to deliver on that promise. Um, obviously overextending the consumer is a terrible idea. Nothing stings more than looking at something you purchased and realizing that you can't pay it off over time. So we are very careful not to extend credit where we think the consumer will not be able to carry the burden. Um, it does help that we don't charge late fees, we don't have compounding interest, all the things that we built in the product from the very beginning to fully align ourselves with our end consumer, help us be motivated to make the right decisions. And so we feel good about our position, our ability to help consumers. Um, I think America will have to borrow more because the prices are going up and we're here to do our part, but we're all also gonna have to be careful with how we use credit. The delinquency rate rose more than 2% for the first time this year in July and August. Is that an alarming sign for you? I think it was more like 1% about a year ago. And how are you addressing that beyond, beyond you know, changing or tightening the, the criteria for underwriting? A great question. Um, credit performance is generally very, very seasonal. So if you sort of look at the charts that we uh, put in our supplement as we file, all of our filings, you'll see that it really is mimicking the patterns of annual performance going back to, for example, 2019. 2020 and 21 were just very, very weird years. On the one hand, there was tons of buying. On the other hand, the government was literally handing out money to consumers. Delinquencies were repressed artificially, if you will. The guardrails we use when we run our business is return on assets, which is basically sort of jargon for yield. What are investors or capital partners get from the loans that we generate and absolute adjusted charge-offs or 
basically losses that we're willing to take on. Obviously, our capital partners would worry if those losses ticked up more than various covenants and agreements that we have. And if you look at all of our metrics, you know, certainly the metrics I look at and the metrics that we file publicly, we have managed to both of those guardrails exceedingly well. If you look at our, for example, allowance for loss provision, it's been ticking down every quarter for the last three. So we are managing credit better than we have even in a much more benign credit climate. Now, what that actually means practically, the cool thing about a firm is because we're integrated so deeply into the merchant ecosystem, we have a lot more interactive tools beyond just your basic, we're so sorry your card has been declined. That's an awful experience, nobody wants to have that. In fact, if you actually look at our approvals quarter to on quarter, I think we added three points of incremental approvals across the entire portfolio. Doesn't mean that everybody on average gets 3% more likely to say yes. It's that we figured out ways to say yes, even when we think the consumer is taking on too much risk for them. For example, we can say, hey, we need to verify your income because we think you're overburdening yourself. Now, if we're convinced that your income is different from what we estimated it to be, it'd be wonderful to extend the credit to you. Or for example, we can say, hey, we think you should make a down payment on this couch or on this bicycle, because once you do that, it's a lot easier for you to carry the burden of this particular loan. So we've really been deploying a lot of those tools all across the last six, nine months. And we've both seen increased demand, increased approvals and better credit outcomes. You know, our firm shares obviously had a pretty big downward move today. There is a broader market sell off. Your CFO said you're approaching the next fiscal year prudently. I mean, what's your reaction to you know, the Affirm stock drop, the broader tech sell-off, and, you know, the possibility we're in for this kind of volatility for the foreseeable future. You know, I think, I think, and I, I don't even have to try, I definitely think of Affirm in measures of years and quarters is not a, it, it's an artificial marker that I think uh, we have met for ourselves. It is far better to worry about how we'll do next year and the year after and a decade from now than what the stock price will do for us tomorrow afternoon. Certainly in a day like today, I think we are a footnote to a footnote to a broader sell-off thanks to the uh, the hawkish policy statements that we just heard. Um, that said, you know, I've never been more excited to show up to work as I am today. We have a ton of stuff to build. We bragged a lot about really amazing engagement metrics in Debit Plus, the card that we've been working on for so long. You know, if, it, it, it definitely, and it, you know, my heart goes out for our team and obviously the investors that look at the, the stock price always want to see it go up. I would encourage them to uh, look to the future. The product that we're building really makes a difference. We see so much positive consumer sentiment. We know what we're doing managing credit. We've done really well and we'll continue to do so. Over time, the market will catch up and the share price will do what it always does. I am very, very focused to leading the company to a long-term successful business of permanent value. So let's talk about the long term. On the call, you talked about the pursuit of growth, the possibility of buying up other players, given you know, the, the, you know, the broader macro environment. Some of these other players may be struggling. We've seen some other players go through, you know, other BNPL players go through some pretty big layoffs. What are you looking at? What kind of companies are you looking at? And, and could we see you know, a big deal or an acquisition spree? Um, Definitely nothing to report today. Uh, I, I want to make sure that there's no no speculation in embedded in my answers here. Uh, but you're totally right. The thing, the way I think about sort of potential targets, and we're definitely looking quite actively now. We have shown to be really, really good at credit management, and obviously the economic reality is uncertain. We'll continue having both hands on the wheel. We'll continue tuning credits and approvals and all that. But we know what we're doing. We, we've shown this to ourselves, and much more importantly, frankly to our credit investors, capital market partners, there are companies that have had amazing ideas. They've built great products. So sort of the beginnings of something really wonderful, but they're just not good at underwriting. And you get better at it with scale and time. We've been at it for 11 years. So we have a lot of data, we have a lot of experience. We know how to manage it. It would be great to find some of these ideas and teams. Really the most important thing about any company is the people running it. And when you find these teams and they're missing that credit management muscle, or access to capital markets, which we've also built up over the years, 
it, you know, it, th those kind of acquisitions are fantastic because you know you you love what they built and you want to make it go faster and, and get bigger. And so that that is what we're looking for. The filter for me, I, I learned, I, I didn't invent this one. This was something one of my investors told me. You know, is this asset better off owned by a firm? And if the answer is yes, you should look. And if the answer is I'm not sure, stop looking now. So we, we apply that filter judiciously.